Tesla's energy business is a sleeping giant with some estimates that energy will double in revenue and grow in margins by the end of this year. And this exponential growth for revenue is expected as the years go on. For this to happen, we needed to start seeing the Megapack factory in China begin construction. Well, good news. There are now signs that building has begun with new equipment spotted on the site. At the signing ceremony in December, they said construction was to begin first quarter. So they are right on time. I've got Hans Nelson joining us, and he's got his own YouTube channel called Hans C. Nelson. Thank you so much, Hans. Thanks, Herbert. This is energy, another one of the big things that are happening. You know, I'm glad that this event occurred because otherwise it's being <laughs> overshadowed by all the progress with bots and FSD. So this is it. We've got Tesla is appearing to be starting Megapack factory construction already. There's all these... Um, the, these these photos and video that we'll show from Wuba, who's actually following it closely, it says here Tesla is closing in on the construction of a new megapack factory in China because equipment has been spotted on the site. They secured a site and held a signing ceremony for the upcoming Shanghai megapack factory in December. And they said that construction was expected to begin in Q1. They just made it within a week's hair of Q1. And then we're going to show video of Wuba. And uh, what's your thoughts about all this? Yeah, obviously, the energy side of the business is exciting. It's something that, you know, we need in order to have more reliable grids. And I think that people um, in, have underestimated the amount of new electricity generation and storage that we're going to need in order to continue to just build out as a society that a lot of the artificial intelligence work that's going on today requires extremely power hungry supercomputers and that the growth in energy demand that's going to be coming from a lot of these new sectors of the economy, which is where the growth and progress is going to happen. Like if we want to avoid some of the debt crises that, you know, we're looking at here in the West and, you know, a around a lot of places in the world that they're looking at the, the only way to get out of those without being stuck in a recession and a terrible economy is to grow your way out. And a lot of that growth has to happen at kind of the forefront of technology. And so we really need to not slow walk the uh, progress forward with these AI supercomputers, um, but we're gonna be running into a bottleneck very soon with our electrical grid and our ability to supply the demand for that electricity. And mega packs are one piece of the cheapest way that we can actually build new grid capacity um, because, you know, it's a lot cheaper to build a solar farm than it is to build like a coal plant or a, a natural gas plant or at this point, even a nuclear plant, even though a lot of that's just mostly driven by regulation. Um, but that is not a source of energy that is able to be integrated into a grid in a way that's stable and to be able to provide power to something like an AI data center that needs like clean, continuous power 24-7. Um, you know, that's not an application that solar is really suited to unless you have the ability to actually store that energy from when it's produced and deploy it when it actually needs to be used. And that's where mega packs obviously come in. And so we really need to grow our electrical grids here over the next 10 years in a large way. Um, obviously that also includes for electric vehicles as well. But I think that that, um, that piece of the electrical demand is going to actually be smaller as a percentage of the overall growth that we need compared to what it's going to be demanded from, you know, new areas of, of supercomputer um, demand. And so this is something that we need just as a society. Um, and mega packs are a very key piece in that. So growing their demand, obviously there's tons of demand for them, not only here in the United States, um, there's going to be tons of demand for them in emerging markets as well. Uh, China has huge demand. So seeing this, plant go into China is going to be a place where they can produce both for India and for China and really, you know, anything on that side of the world. Um, but I wouldn't be, I'd be very surprised if the entire capacity of that Shanghai Gigafactory isn't eaten up just by China, much less um, India is going to need quite a bit of capacity as well. And so um, these are also very profitable factories that we've heard Elon say in the past that he expects the energy business over time 
to actually be larger than the core auto business. Now I assume he means the core auto business without full self-driving, um, just the vehicles themselves. Uh, and this is the second step. You know, we've seen Lathrop has proven out that it is able to reach scale. Um, it's becoming more and more profitable every day. And now we have this new site that is the next step in that. And remember when Tesla launched Giga Shanghai, it actually came online faster, reached profitability faster, um, and was able to really contribute to the bottom line of Tesla as a company much more quickly than the company was able to achieve there when it was operating out of California. And so that's something I also expect to see from Shanghai. I think that we'll see energy profits blowing to the bottom line in Tesla much more quickly from Shanghai than we've seen so far from Lathrop, which will accelerate just that narrative in the general public's mind that energy is a large and significant and meaningful part of Tesla's business moving forward. Appreciate all that. So that triggered a thought. I was able to get um, some new data I'll share here about the energy requirements of the supercomputers that you talked about. But regardless of that, energy is critical. We've been waiting. We had Lathrop uh, scale. Now we're hoping that uh, we were waiting for Mega Pack Factory Shanghai to come out. Now it's coming out, but we're going to see a lot more. I'm predicting at least one Mega Pack Factory announced every single year from now on, if not multiple. In fact, uh, we're starting to hear rumors of that now. So let me share this with you first. This is very interesting. This guy named Kyle Corbett said this. He spoke to a Microsoft engineer on the GPT-6 training cluster project. He's, he's, I don't know, vetched about the pain they're having provisioning infinity band class links between GPUs in different regions. So he then asked them, why not just co-locate co the cluster in one region then if you're having troubles? He goes, oh yeah, we tried that first. We can't put more than 100,000 H100s NVIDIA chips in a single state without bringing down the power grid. So <clears throat> this is the first, you know, we knew this was the case, but here's somebody who's apparently in the know saying that, look, <laughs> I can, we can only do 100,000 H100s and you're going to bring down the power grid now. So they're hitting the limits of power available today. Microsoft, Google, these these guys, Amazon, they're gonna to need to be buying <laughs> jokingly, you know, nuclear power plants. They need something to power this. They need mega pack factories. Tesla has that. They're working on that. So let's uh, let's before I get to the energy and the impact of energy to Tesla stock and, and revenues, let's go back to the mega pack factory. I'm gonna play this video from Wuwa. He's amazing. He's always following these very closely. Um and so, you know, the, what I heard, what I learned about these mega pack factories like Lathrop, it's the size of a Walmart, a Target in the mall. <laughs> it's not very big at all. It's not like one of these gigafactories. <clears throat> and it can, they can bring this up within a year. So the expectation is this, you know, now that we've begun constructions here in Shanghai, it's, I think their estimates is within nine months, this should be up and running, um, at least construction ended. So here's the science here that, you know, you've got these uh, cranes already there on the lot, big size, <clears throat> you know, I bet you they might even double what they need here. I mean, it looks much bigger than they need here. So you can see that they've already started and there's movement happening. Yeah. Yeah. And don't Any forget that the battery supply chain there in Shanghai is much more robust than honestly we have here in the United States. That's one of the reasons why we had the IRA in the first place. And so, you know, when they were ramping Lathrop, they're having to do a lot of importing of a lot of the materials that go into these mega packs from a battery standpoint from China in the first place. And so setting up this factory there right in the same vicinity as a lot of this supply chain exists will mean that this, uh, Factory will actually both probably be able to ramp faster um, on on multiple fronts, you know, because the supply chain is closer. Also, because they've already done this, so it'll, it should ramp faster on that perspective as well. Um, but then all of that should mean higher levels of profitability as well, um, or the ability to reduce the costs and sell them in larger volume. Either way, this should be really a positive thing for Tesla. It's a big positive thing. We've been waiting for this. Glad that it's happening. Uh, you know, it's probably a little delayed than we expected, but it's starting to happen. And we're going to hear more and more about this. So this is Rohan Patel. He's one of the top executives at Tesla. And he said this, he, he's uh, responded to a Indian um, article that was written, India needs advanced 
battery electric. Do you know what the BESS stands for? Uh, storage ecosystem. system. Battery electric yeah, battery storage electric system storage. ecosystem to support 500 gigawatts of non-fossil energy target by 2032. And he said the potential for battery storage in big growth markets is astounding. It needs regionalized supply chains and fair markets to enable a clean, efficient, resilient grid. I don't know. That's another hint, maybe. <laughs> but uh, India yeah. could be another area. Yeah, what's your thoughts? Well, I, and we can just think about the growth of the telecommunications infrastructure in a lot of developing nations as one way, you know, to to kind of, it is thinking by analogy, but I think it's an instructive model that in the United States, you know, we built out all sorts of complicated landlines all over the crisscrossing the country, crisscrossing all these neighborhoods. And that was very expensive in order to be able to provide the service that we enjoyed, you know, throughout most of the 20th century to be able to call people, you know, on a landline. And <clears throat> all of that infrastructure was just really too complicated, too expensive for most nations in the world to actually be able to have access to. But then when the technology progressed to the point where we could have wireless, well, then all of a sudden you started seeing, you know, countries with some of the poorest people in the world still having pretty decent cell coverage. And it's because that infrastructure was cheaper and easier to set up than the previous version of the technology's infrastructure. And that's what these, I think we're gonna move into an era, an era of microgrids that, <clears throat> and this is what we've been hearing from people like Tony Sieben now for a long time, that the, the trajectory of the cost of solar panels of wind turbines is just continuing to decline every year. And it's inevitable that as a lot of other sources of energy are getting more and more expensive and solar and wind are getting cheaper and cheaper, that as long as you have the ability to, like we said, store that energy from when it's generated and deploy it when it needs to be used, and you have that buffer in the system, that all of a sudden that system gets to be a lot cheaper to install and to operate than previous versions of our energy infrastructure. And so, you know, there's going to be just a huge boom over the next really probably 50 years of a new generation of energy infrastructure that's built out all across the world. Um, India is a huge place of innovation and growth right now. Obviously, they have a, a very large and very intelligent, sophisticated population, um, but they do have a lot of drawbacks or not drawbacks they have a lot of setbacks that they're facing from an infrastructure standpoint that they haven't been able to build out all of these things you know that we have in some of the more developed nations um, and these new waves of technological development will offer them the ability to catch up basically to where we're at at lower prices than we were able to build them out here um, and that will really be a, a great benefit i think to the world it should be just uh you know a rising tide that lifts all boats from an economic standpoint for more Indians to actually be able to participate at an even higher level in the global economy than they've been able to in the past. That's, uh, that's right. So in the, in the, what happened in the cellular telecommunication, you said, was that companies that were, or countries that were, uh, you know, not, not yet first world, they leapfrogged the existing technology. Mm -hmm. And so yep. here, they're going to want to have data centers, they're going to have one power, they're going to be you know, announcing these kinds of projects sooner and later, we're going to hear the demand of this is just through the roof. And so Tesla is set up properly. They've now done one Lathrop. They've got the second. Now this Shanghai Megapack factory is the same as Lathrop, right? It's still, it's 10,000 Megapacks per year is the capacity. And I think it's 40 gigawatt hours. Yeah. So, but you know, once they've got one, they've got the second one, they're going to just pump these out. <laughs> just gonna, but remember, that's them. also what they said for Giga Shanghai, that, you know, they put the nameplate capacity of the factory as, you know, roughly equal to what they had in Fremont. And then mm -hmm. it wasn't like they never officially announced that they had increased, but they were producing more vehicles than the nameplate capacity. So they they actually had built out more infrastructure than they led us to believe at the beginning. And I think that that you know, I don't know that that's 100% going to happen in this case, but I think it's definitely possible and something to look out for. And, um, you know, we've also been hearing lots of talk about factories going into India. If I was a betting man, I would bet that we see a mega factory in India before yeah, we see an auto factory in India. Yeah. 
Um, and so, yeah, this is, uh, it's just something to continue to keep a close eye on and to be excited about because it just means that more people around the world are going to have better access to the standard of living that people in the developed nations already get to enjoy. Um, and that we can do all of that while solving a bunch of our climate crises in the process. And so it is a hopeful future. It is an exciting future. It's a future with less risk and more prosperity. And Tesla is a huge factor that makes all of that possible. So when we just saw the video of Wuwa and, uh, you know, it looked like the land area is much more bigger than they need for this mega pack. So they probably will double it. We'll see. Like you said, we don't know. But uh, just to remind everybody that a year ago, you and I did a show where we showed that, you know, when Elon went around and he was shaking hands with all of these, you know, dignitaries and leaders of all these countries, we pointed out that nine of them were part of the top 10 of the largest, you know, producing economic powers out there. And so they are very likely, he was signing, handing, you know, shaking hands, four mega pack factories is what there's most likely doing. The only country that he hasn't yet met with the top leadership is Japan uh, of the nine, that they're one of the top 10. And so that's why we're predicting that <laughs> maybe there's political scenarios there, but uh, you know, they're gonna need to do this. So yeah, I have no doubt that every one of these countries, more likely that they'll announce a mega pack a partnership with Tesla way before they do an auto, because the auto, they'll just need one per region, but every country needs their own mega pack factory. Every one of them needs their own. And now that they're doing data centers, <laughs> gloves are off. Tesla themselves might need to, you know, announce a couple just for themselves to yep. run their own data centers. Elon has said, right? These data, these these age in order to hit AGI, you need the large data centers. You can see these data centers from the from the from the from the uh, space because they will be all lit up. And if you needed to shut them down, you just shut down the electricity because they need so much power to run. Uh, where's that power going to come from? It's going to yep. come from the sky. It's going to come from mega pack factories. Any predictions on your side? Um, I think another piece of the puzzle might actually be fuel cells. And, um, you know, I think this is one of those areas where hydrogen does start to make a little bit more sense than it does mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. some other areas of this overall energy transition. And, you know, it's not just me saying that, but actually Tesla's master plan, they, they talked about different ways that hydrogen can play into that overall grid stability and that energy arbitrage, you know, potentially over long periods of time. Like if you have one season where you're able to overproduce and then you're, you know, maybe say you're generating a lot of solar in the, in the summertime, for instance, um, but then you actually need to use some of that energy in the wintertime that battery storage really doesn't make as much sense in a situation like that. And so you actually might be doing some sort of hydrogen production and then storing it away like in fracking wells or something um, and then extracting it later. And so there, there are other things that are also gonna be important in all of this. Um, you know, there are also some, some interesting fuel cell manufacturers that are able mm. to run on, I think both hydrogen and natural gas, but much, much more cleanly than anything that we have access to do. I think, you know, those are also going to be important in this overall energy transition. Like the biggest thing is we need a lot more energy and obviously nuclear should be a much bigger piece of what we do in the future. Uh, if we get out of our own stinking way, I don't know if we can do that or not, but you know, that's where I get a little bit more hope for some of these other newer technologies, just because they don't have as much of a, a roadblock in front of them from a regulatory standpoint. Um, because, you know, if if we would take the gloves off for nuclear, that really could solve our problem all by itself. Um, but yeah, we're, we're just not going to do that. And so we need to have some other solutions that we can get behind as well. And, you know, the Silver lining in all of it is that, man, the collective human consciousness is actually really smart. We can actually solve really hard problems. And uh -huh. we're able to, you know, if if we run into a roadblock with being too dumb to build the nuclear capacity that we need to, well, we can find other ways. And that is what history has proven out time and time again over thousands yeah. and thousands of years. This is not going to be any different. Uh, we, when we encounter problems that cause us enough pain, we figure out solutions and that's what oh, we're heading into so... this, this next hundred years. <laughs> Such an optimist. You're more optimistic than me. Uh, so we've heard Elon, uh, 
promote and agree that nuclear is something that um, should be used more. He's thinking big. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm still going to stand by my prediction that Tesla will announce some very large solar farms. A lot of people think that I'm wrong. I just keep saying that. I, I think that that's very three. feasible. Yeah. Master plan part three, the number one pillar of the three pillars is uh, energy generation. Tesla doesn't do energy generation yet, uh, except for the solar roofs. And that has failed. That that business is not going anywhere for Tesla. And so they need to generate power. Where are they going to get it from? And you just saw this thing about how, you know, these H100s in one co-located region can 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 uh, can be not enough power in that state, take down the power grid. And so they need power. They need more power. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, I, I can't imagine, you know, them announcing that this is what they're going to do next. We'll see. But um, well, I think. To answer that question a little bit, that's why they are their focus is so much on the mega packs because China honestly is doing a great job at producing mm -hmm. solar cell. Like right. Tesla doesn't need necessarily to innovate to be the one on mm -hmm. the on the solar cell side because that industry already exists. It's up and running. It the the cost declines are coming consistently. Like Tesla doesn't have any have to do anything there in order for us to realize those cost declines that are going to make solar energy so much cheaper over the next decade. Um, they do, they're really at the forefront of, you know, they're obviously not the only battery storage uh, producer, you know, you've got other people like Enphase and um, I don't know, there's other one that people in the, in the U S that people are really excited about EOS. that also mm -hmm. EOS. Yeah. That starts with an E um, that's a little bit more long duration. And then a, a bunch of people in China that are doing this as well. But Tesla is like, they're really catalyzing that industry. And they, I think their move into using those LFP cells in a very efficient way in both the power walls and the mega packs, like the, the entire project in Australia to really kickstart all of this, that was a Tesla thing. So, you know, as far as a leverage uh, play goes, Tesla is able to do the most to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy by focusing primarily their efforts on the mega pack business and both from a, a hardware side, but then also from a software side that really innovating on the auto bidder system and the ability to use the mm -hmm. free market to really manage that arbitrage of storage from when is the power produced and optimizing it so that it can be produced when it's cheap as possible and then delivered when it's needed the most. Um, so all of their innovation in those areas is incredibly important. Like that is really moving the needle in, in accelerating our ability to actually realize the benefits that the solar industry is going to make possible, but they can't make it possible by themselves without that, that storage piece in place and without that software in place. Yeah. The need for energy is so powerful, but mm -hmm. going back to what you said at the very beginning, the biggest thing is data centers, data centers, get you to AGI, get to AI. And, uh, this is the thing that's kind of the secret, uh, you know, sauce that Tesla has that few others have at this point that's going to matter, right? So Elon's already said today, the bottleneck is chips. Tomorrow, next year, a couple of years from now, years, it's going to be transformers. And then mm -hmm. two or three years from now, everybody's going to be demanding energy. And so Tesla has set themselves up well to be, to, to have been working on this for, you know, a decade. And so they're, you know, they've got two mega pack factories. They're going to probably <laughs> announce more, but they need one just for these AI, yep. AGI data warehouses. Talking about transformers and how those are actually kind of a bottleneck in this whole energy growth transition, the reason that they are needed in the first place is because we generate the electricity that we're going to use so far away from where it actually gets used. And so it has to be transported over long distances um, on these huge power lines, you know, that run all across the country. And so that transmission has to happen at very, very high voltages in order to be efficient. And so you have to you have to have a transformer to actually convert it from whatever the low voltage source is that it's being generated at up to high voltage to transport it a long way. And then you have to transform it back down to the voltage that you're going to use it at. <clears throat> and so if you can generate 
your electricity closer to where you're going to use it and you don't have to transport it through those transmission lines, you can actually eliminate transformers on both ends from the from the generation side and from the, the endpoint usage side. And so, you know, having mega pack, you know, smaller solar farms closer to where the energy is being used paired with mega packs reduces the strain on the overall electric grid and and reduces the need for transformers as well and so you know, that's another way that these mega packs not only is it storage in general that it provides that ability to for the grid to have that which is important but also it reduces that need for for moving electricity long distances um so it, it has kind of like a double whammy positive effect on just being extremely beneficial for the grid over the long run. It's going to be great. Thank you so much, Hans. Follow him on his uh, YouTube channel and also his ex at Hans C. Nelson. Thank you, everybody. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.